So apologies to the one dog in the room today because this is a cat day, <laughs> a cat day. Cats are very important. They don't get so much research focus. Actually, as a pathologist, we don't see as many cases from cats as we do from dogs. Uh, so they, they, they don't get so much attention. I'd um, just like to acknowledge my colleague, Melanie Dobromilski. She is a specialist in feline pathology and she gave me some some of the photos I'm going to use. She's in the UK, so she couldn't come today. Um, okay, so we'll just get going. Was there anyone here who wasn't here for the mast cell tumor talk or didn't see it? So, oh, shameful. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but that doesn't matter because for those of you who were, I'm just going to repeat some of those things that I went through about what cancer is, what that means, and then I'm going to get more complicated because I want you to understand what a sarcoma is. So it's going to be fine. But we're just going to get a, go a bit further this time. OK, so there's some different spokes animals this time, but the same definitions. So a tumor, what we call a tumor or a neoplasm, is a mass formed by cells that are increasing in number. So they're either growing abnormally fast and or they're not dying when they should. So we get this mass growing because they just increased numbers of cells as time goes on. So neoplasia or neoplasm could be benign or it could be malignant. Benign tumors can still be a problem. They often grow quite slowly, but they sometimes cause problems because of where they are. So for example, if they're in the skin, we might start to get an ulcer over the top as it becomes bigger. Or for example, if something's inside the brain, there's not a lot of room to move there. So something quite benign could cause actually a lot of damage. But those are not cancers. Those are benign tumors or benign neoplasms. So cancers are the malignant ones. And when we're talking about oncology, that's what we're talking about. So people often panic when they see a mass. Right, they just automatically assume it's cancer, but cancer is only the malignant form of it. And what do cancers do? Well, they tend to invade the tissue around them. Um, so shown in this diagram here, this is usually what a benign mass would look like. So they're often, you know, we can see the margins and they're often quite rounded and they just gradually expand. Whereas cancers tend to crawl into the surrounding tissue and they have quite an irregular look to them. And the other problem with cancer that we worry about possibly even more is that they will spread or can spread to distant sites in the body. And that's what we mean by metastasis. So local invasion, metastasis, <coughs> those are the problems with cancer. Okay, so now we're gonna go into what a sarcoma is. There are these huge families of cells, normal cells in our body. One family is called epithelial cells, which I'm not going to talk about. And from epithelial cells, we get carcinomas. But there's another big family of cells called mesenchymal cells. So I'm just going to go through all the cells that come under this classification. So lots of them are inside connective tissue and they make it. So if we look at skin, and ages ago I showed you skin when I was talking about laminitis. So all this pink stuff here is the dermis of the skin and that's collagen. And inside that collagen are cells called fibroblasts that make the collagen and they help sustain it. We can't see them very well from here. Let's look at a piece of tendon. So tendons and ligaments largely made up of collagen and inside that collagen you can see these nuclei here, kind of long cells, those are fibroblasts. Pretty much every tissue has collagen in it, and pretty much every organ and tissue has fibroblasts in it. In bone, we have some other mesenchymal cells. This is our bony kind of matrix here, and around the outside are cells called osteoblasts that make it. In cartilage, we have mesenchymal cells called chondrocytes. So all this blue stuff here is the cartilage matrix that we'd see, for example, in a joint. Okay, we also have mesenchymal cells lining blood vessels. So here we have a blood vessel. We can see all the little red blood cells inside it. So this is the vessel here. And you see those little dark nuclei around the edge. So those are endothelial cells. 
they're mesenchymal cells too. The cells that form fat are mesenchymal cells, so this is what fat looks like, what most of us are trying to get rid of most of the time. Uh, so each, each of these bubbly kind of things is a cell that's full of fat. So they're called adipocytes, and they're mesenchymal cells too. Blood cells are also mesenchymal cells. A lot of them are made in your bone marrow. Here's our adipocytes again. We see them in bone marrow too, and there's all sorts of different cells in here uh, that eventually get released out into the blood. No one needs to memorize this, but it's just showing how complicated this is. In terms of cancers, uh, most of them are derived either from lymphocytes, which are a type of immune cell, or here's our familiar mast cell, so mast cell tumors in animals. These cells, not so often. So all of those are mesenchymal cells. Muscle cells are mesenchymal cells, and there's three types of muscle. So this is the one we usually think about. Skeletal muscle, great big muscle fibers here. Smooth muscle, so for example in your gut, along the wall, there's a lot of smooth muscle that propels the food through the gut. It's also in walls of blood vessels, and walls of airways, all sorts of different places. And your heart, so the cardiac muscle. So all of those are mesenchymal cells. So we could go on and on talking about mesenchymal cells. It's a big family of cells. So a sarcoma is a malignant tumor or neoplasm that arises from a mesenchymal cell. So it's a very general term. So when we're saying feline injection site sarcoma, it's not a specific tumor. It's just a general type of tumor. However, we don't use it for cancers arising from blood cells. So you'll hear people talking about lymphoma or leukemia or mast cell tumor. Now, it wouldn't be wrong to say this is a mast cell sarcoma, but it's just not what people do. So it's a convention, and it doesn't always make sense, and that's why veterinary students and medical students spend a lot of time learning names, uh, because it doesn't always follow what it should. Okay, so the first part of a name of a sarcoma tells you what cell type that came from. So there's a lot of Latin involved that people have to learn. So fibro refers to fibroblast, and most of these injection site sarcomas are fibrosarcomas. So on the left here we have a fibrosarcoma. You can see these kind of long cells with pink collagen in between. This one is actually what we would call well differentiated, which means the cells very much resemble normal fibroblasts, and it means usually the cancer is not as aggressive. Okay, if we had a bone tumour, it would be called an osteosarcoma, and you guys fund research in osteosarcomas. And that picture I just showed you before, we had that kind of pink stuff, which is the bony matrix. And here we have our tumour cells inside. They're not nicely sitting around the edge of it as a normal bone. A chondrosarcoma would be from a cartilage cell. So these words sound very complicated, but when you kind of break them down into their pieces, which is what I used to tell the students at the vet school, it's not as complicated as it seems. Leomyo means smooth muscle, so if you had a, a sarcoma rising there, it'd be a leomyosarcoma. So it sounds like a great big long word, but if you know leomyo means smooth muscle, you can work that out. Hemangio means endothelial cells, so I was showing you line in the blood vessel. So if we had a sarcoma from an endothelial cell, it would be called a hemangiosarcoma. And we do see those in dogs and cats quite frequently, and they're really quite nasty, aggressive cancers. Okay, is everyone clear about now what a sarcoma is? Okay, yeah. I am, but can you explain the difference one more time between a sarcoma and a carcinoma? Okay, so a carcinoma, carcinomas come from epithelial cells. Yeah, so like, the, the cells on the surface of your skin that line your gut or your airways, they're all epithelial cells. So they would all be carcinomas. Thank you. Yeah? Okay, so let's get back to feline injection site sarcomas. When did this first happen? Okay, so this was first noticed in the mid-1980s. 
and the first publication was in 1991. And this just kind of demonstrates how science works. It takes a while for everyone to realise when something starts happening. People hadn't really worked out what it was associated with. Then maybe people go to some meetings, they start talking about it. Then you might need to get a grant to fund that work. We all know that takes a lot of time. You might not get the money, etc. Finally, you get the money, you do the work, then you have to write the paper. The paper has to be accepted, etc. So, science is not exactly as fast as we think it is. And this was pre digital. So, this was uh, everything was on bits of paper and so forth. So this actually, it happening in the mid 1980s and then being published in 1991 was pretty fast for the time. And the first paper was just kind of has a title, you know, was vaccination causing these sarcomas. This happened at the same time that it was starting to be really strictly recommended that cats be vaccinated. Um, and there were new vaccines coming through. So when I'm saying FELV, I mean feline leukemia virus and the killed rabies vaccine. So it, it coincided with this happening. In 1996, there was a formation of a sarcoma task force to try and deal with this problem. This was around about the time I was training as a pathology resident, so we were just reading all these papers and things all the time. There was a lot of publicity, everyone was very concerned about it, quite rightly so. Do I vaccinate my cat or not? All of these cats are getting cancer. In 1998, they formed the Feline Vaccination Advisory Panel. So this is the first time an organisation had got together and put out guidelines, and you can still go and look at those guidelines now. And it was recognised worldwide. So it started off here in the States, but we then saw it in other countries. So I worked in the UK and Australia and New Zealand. I've seen it in all of those countries. So uh, we don't vaccinate against rabies in those countries. So that was a bit of a clue that it wasn't just about rabies vaccination. I thought I'd better explain what adjuvant is right now, because I've just mentioned it uh, when I'm talking about vaccines. So what is adjuvant? So when we give a vaccine that is a virus that's still alive and it's just kind of been inactivated so it can't cause disease, we usually get enough of an immune response to it so it will protect the animal later on. If that's not the case, and it's usually with killed vaccines, so it's just like a, a protein from a, a virus or another infectious agent, then we usually need to give something with it to boost the immune response, get enough of that happening that we get protection. Okay, so the antigen we're giving alone may not be enough. It also sometimes helps push the immune response kind of the way we want it, because there's all sorts of different immune cells, and there are certain immune cells we want to be activated by this. And the most common, and I say aluminium, but I guess you guys say aluminium, right? I'm going to say aluminium, it's my culture. So uh, the most common is aluminium compounds. Okay, so which cats get it? Your computer has shifted my title there. Uh, there are estimates of somewhere between 1 in 1,000 to 1 in 10,000 vaccinated cats. It's probably well below 1 in 10,000. It doesn't sound like a lot, but let's go further with this and think about it. Um, the mean age is about eight years, but it can be earlier. Cats also get sarcomas reasonably frequently that aren't related to injection. So there's a little bit of a difference in the mean age, but I don't really think eight versus nine is really much of a difference. And it can happen anywhere from two months after injection to 10 years. So you can see it could be quite hard to link those events. Why well, it took a while for people to realise what was happening. Okay, so why does it happen? Well, we don't really know. Obviously, we're injecting a vaccine and there's an inflammatory response, which we want. We want the immune system to come and react. Um, but for some reason, this is leading to cancer. So it's been associated pretty definitively with injection, but we don't know 
Why? And it seems to be a combination of the animal itself and obviously the species and the characteristics of whatever we're putting in there. And you know, this is cancer, it's not simple. There's all sorts of different things coming into this. Obviously you're injecting, the animal might be quite susceptible. There might be some genetic things, but definitely being a cat is a risk factor. So is it just a cat thing? Well, there has been reports of these occurring in ferrets uh, in response to rabies vaccine. There's one report in a horse. There's also been publication looking at dogs, um, comparing dogs that had this associated with injection or not with cats. It's very hard to kind of look at the whole population of animals and tell but anecdotally, I can tell you as a pathologist, in the last 20 years, I've seen maybe one or two dog sarcomas at injection sites. I've never seen an equine one. I've done a lot of horse work. I've looked at a lot of ferrets. I don't think I've ever had one of these. But if I'm working as a pathologist, probably every day I'll see an injection site sarcoma or one that I suspect is. So although it occurs in other species is not very frequent and it's largely a feline problem but not entirely okay so you know when we started this everyone was talking about it's rabies vaccine it's the aluminium so what is it that is actually associated well pretty much everything um, all of these vaccines the feline leukaemia, the rabies, just vaccines that have aluminium in them. And these viruses here, and this is kind of the standard vaccination your cat would get. So everything. But also injections that aren't vaccines. Not as often, but steroids, antibiotics, painkillers, anti-flea treatments have all been associated. And also foreign objects, so just occasionally microchips or non-absorbable sutures. So when I was training as a resident, we called it vaccine-associated sarcoma, and now we've changed to call it feline injection site sarcoma. And you've got to be careful to, not to assign a cause. You know, we inject vaccines probably more frequently than anything else, so you can't necessarily say it's specifically the vaccine. It could just be we just inject those things more. So all of these things have been associated. So what increases the risk? There have been some very interesting epidemiological studies about what happens. So here's a study in 1993, 345 cats. It's not an enormous study, but that's quite a, a, a large number of cats. So when I'm talking about interscapula, right, that means in the scruff of the neck, scapula means shoulder blade, so in between the shoulder blades. So if you vaccinate once, you increase the risk by 50%. If you go there twice, the risk increases by more than 120%. If you go there three or four times, which is what we used to do all the time every year, uh, then it goes up this much. It doesn't mean there's a 50% chance now your cat's going to get a tumour. It's just if you hadn't put anything there, you've now put the risk right up. Just remember it's, you know, one in 10,000 cats, so it's not as extreme as it looks. And another study um, done 10 years later, they found that, so usually you know when you get your pet vaccinated, the veterinarian goes to the fridge, gets out the vaccine, and they found that if they were warmed up to room temperature first, that reduced the risk. So if you take your cat in, tell the veterinarian to warm the vaccine up for five minutes before they put it in. That, and, and you know, these surprising things that come when you start looking at large numbers of animals and trying to work out what the risk is. Okay, what does not increase the risk? Well, the adjuvant in that study didn't seem to be associated. And this is all we talked about in the mid 90s was, was that it was about aluminium. Um, sometimes when we look at these things histologically, these cells are called macrophages. They're a type of inflammatory cell that comes into ingest uh, foreign material, sometimes deal with infection. So they'll come in and this blue stuff inside them is the aluminium compound. So we'll sometimes see that. 
there's still some debate and we have to be careful not to just take one study and say that's the answer. Um, so, you know, it's interesting, but we shouldn't say, well, definitively aluminium is not involved. It, you know, it may be in some way, in some animals. What does not increase the risk? Well, it didn't seem to be anything to do with what the vaccine was, whether we mix the vaccines together, which we would sometimes do, uh, whether we used a vaccine that had multiple kind of vaccines in together from the manufacturer, reusing disposable syringes, which you shouldn't be doing anyway. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure how that came into it. <laughs> uh, size of the needle, um, shaking the vial before you injected it, massaging after vaccination, you know, which we often would do, uh, and the gender of the cat. So all these things people have talked about, and then you go and do a study and it seems that's not associated. That said, it was just one study. Okay, so where does this occur? Um, the classic site is the interscapula, which you now know means between the shoulder blades. And it's just an easy place to inject things for veterinarians, a lot of loose skin. Um, other sites included neck, chest, back, limbs. Again, if people had injected there, then it was associated with it. You can see how big these things get. You know, it's quite, quite horrific looking tumours sometimes. Sometimes the injector material kind of leaks away from where it was put. So you can see scenarios where the cat was injected on the hind leg, but it leaked onto the abdomen and you got a sarcoma there. So again, that's kind of difficult to document if it's not exactly where it was injected. Since 1996, there's been a reduction in tumours at this site and an increase on the right limbs. And just keep in mind, we'll come back to it, but in 1996, that task force came into action. So just keep that in mind. We're going to come back to that point. Okay, for those of you who don't like gory things, this is a warning. I'm going to show you a post-mortem picture of one of these uh, lesions. I actually edited it a little. It's much more horrific than it now is. Okay, so the cat's head is out here. You can just see the ear. There's one leg there, one leg. So this is the interscapular region. You see how horrible that looks, really kind of regular. They often feel what we call well circumscribed, which means you can kind of feel the edges of it, but that's often not actually the case. They're often quite infiltrative. They're often firm and white because they're often fibrosarcomas, and fibroblasts make collagen, so they make collagen, and that makes them that consistency. Um, they'll either be in the subcutis, which is the fatty tissue under the skin, or the skeletal muscle, depending on where the injection was put. But they can extend very, very deeply into underlying tissue, so even though they might not feel like it, they often have done that. When cut into, for some reason, you know, if you took it out and cut into it, there'd often be some mucus, mucus material or watery fluid in the center, and we'll see that histologically under the microscope. Size varies widely, uh, which depends on, to some extent, how fast it grew, but largely on how long the owners take to find it and take the cat to the vet. So, generally recommend the donors now are monitoring these injection sites. Okay, so in, in terms of if there's a lump in your cat, at what point should you be worried about that? Uh, there is this three, two, one rule. So if there's a lump there at the injection site, and it's been there for more than three months, it measures more than two centimetres in diameter, and over the last month it's been growing in size, then it's recommended that that be investigated. So, you know, cats will get inflammatory kind of lumps there, won't necessarily be a cancer, but if you're starting to see these things, then they generally recommend biopsying that lump. So most of them are fibrosarcomas, but we do see other types. Liposarcoma, so lipo means fat, so that comes from the adipocytes. It's not very common, but we do see them. If it started off in the skeletal muscle, and now vets, it's not recommended to inject down into it. Rhabdomyo means skeletal muscle. Remember, laomyo meant smooth muscle, so sometimes those. Sometimes what we call mixosarcoma, and it's kind of like a fibrosarcoma, but it makes a lot of this mucusy kind of stuff. 
We can see nerve sheath tumours, so there are fibroblast-like cells around nerves and sometimes the tumour will come from that. We can see osteosarcomas. Now there's no bone under there, under the skin, so either the fibroblasts have been changed by that injection or it might be that there are stem cells in there and stem cells can turn into pretty much anything. And the same with chondrosarcoma. We don't have cartilage there, but we can see those tumours. Um, the osteosarcomas are generally particularly aggressive. Sometimes we call it undifferentiated sarcoma, which means it's so bizarre looking we can't tell anymore what cell type it started off as which is not a good sign. Okay, so what does it look like to a pathologist? There's this kind of continuum of things. So it can range from a cat that's just got an inflammatory mass there, it hasn't started becoming cancer, through to sarcoma. This is an inflammatory mass. Um, so here's our skin up here. You can see the little hair follicles. It's kind of upside down. This is the subcutis, so this is the fatty tissue, and here's our inflammation. These big round things here are huge clusters of lymphocytes that have come in and they're really active. Uh, and then in the middle here we have some other sorts of inflammatory cells, which I'll show you here. So generally our macrophages uh, and our, some more lymphocytes and cells called neutrophils, which are the cells that make pus, actually. So they're just a certain type of white blood cell. The problem can be is it's not like this line where something's inflammation and now it's cancer. It's this kind of continuum. You know, it's gradually changing from being inflammation into cancer. And so although most of the time it's quite clear cut, we do have these cases where we can't tell. And that's really difficult for the pathologist and the clinician because you then have to decide, well, we're not really sure, should we treat it as cancer? And so those difficult situations do arise. This is definitively a fibrosarcoma. So the cancer cells are much larger than normal fibroblasts. When I'm talking nuclei, I'm talking about these round things. Okay, so they're much larger than they usually are. The cells vary in size, and the worse that variation is, the worse the cancer is. And you can see these huge cells here with more than one nucleus. So these are called giant cells. This is a particularly common feature. Again, suggests the cells are just not doing what they should do, so not able to divide properly. So the cancer cells are dividing to make new ones. This is one of the ways I said cancer grows. And we can tell when they're doing that. So this is what's called the nucleus kind of disappears. And we see this kind of blue stuff here that's called a mitotic figure. So we might count those, and the more mitotic figures there are, the worse the cancer is. So they tend to be what we call anaplastic, and anaplastic means they're not resembling the cells they came from anymore. So before I showed you one, I said that was well differentiated, not such a bad cancer, but most of them are anaplastic. So they've really changed a lot and become quite bizarre compared to what a fibroblast would usually be. I hope that makes sense. It's very difficult to explain the whole field of cancer pathology in one slide. <laughs> okay, so there can be some clues when, so I've, I've got a case of this, I'm looking at it, and I'm trying to decide, is, it, is injection possibly a cause? And one is, when I showed you that inflammatory mass, there were those dark areas of lymphocytes. So seeing them along the edge like this of the tumour can indicate it. That said, um, tumours of all types vary very significantly in the immune response, so it's not a definitive thing. One thing I do regard as definitive is if I see that aluminium um, compound within macrophages on the side of the tumour, so here we can see some here, I'd be pretty confident that was an injection site sarcoma at that point. The problem is that most of the time you don't see it. Um, so there's really no way to know, and so usually the report goes back to the veterinarian, please look at the records for this animal to see if there was an injection, and they never get back to me and say if, if there was or wasn't, so that just kind of goes back to them to sort out. And you know, sometimes they don't have the records, so um, you know, you end up with the decision to make 
because if it is injection site associated, they're often more aggressive, and so your treatment should be more aggressive. So, you know, we don't have any kind of marker we can put on it to tell for sure. And so if we compare it with one that wasn't associated with injection, we'd be more worried about it. Okay, so what do they do? They are very, very invasive locally. If they were caused by injection, they tend to be more aggressive than if they weren't. Histologically, um, we often see these kind of tongues of tumor cells extending into the surrounding tissue. They are very prone to recur after we've taken them off surgically, so up to half of them do. And they can often recur along the scar. So here's a cat, here's a cat's head. This is the surgical scar, and you can see these little masses popping up along it. Even, you know, they might have thought they got the whole thing out, but, you know, they'll often come back. So a lot of cats need to be operated on repeatedly, uh, and a lot of the time the owners, you know, after a while they don't want to continue with it because you're just doing repeated surgery, so a lot of cats are, end up being euthanized. About 10 to 25 percent of them metastasize, which we now know what that means, to the lungs. They tend to get into blood vessels and spread up there. Um, that said, it doesn't, with a lot of carcinomas, it happens quite quickly, but with these sarcomas, it tends to be quite a long way into the whole thing. So the longer the cat survives, then the more likely it is that that's going to happen. And they can also spread to lymph nodes. So when I was talking about mast cell tumor, and I was talking about glands and how we look at glands and different glands or lymph nodes drain different areas of the body uh, and where the tumor is will determine which of the lymph nodes we might look at to see if it was there or not. Um, there isn't a picture for cats, actually. This dog work was only done a few years ago. And it's quite an important thing, actually, to know what lymph node to look at. So it's kind of surprising, the, the lack of information. OK, so how do we treat these? Uh, obviously, surgical removal. Um, you can see how much tissue here we're going to have to take out. So we need to take the mass out with three to five centimetres. So that's from here to the edge of the mass out. And when I say facial planes, there's these kind of layers of connective tissue underneath the skin, and we want to go right down um, deep to that mass to try and get the whole thing out. Sometimes they're really going down deeply, and they might need to take out muscle. They might need to take out bone. So they might take out the top of the shoulder blades there. Um, they might take out, if it's on the hind limb, part of the pelvis, sometimes half of the pelvis. Sometimes they'll take, there's these processes come up from the vertebrae and the spinal column. They'll take those off to get the sarcoma out. So it's pretty nasty surgery. It's been shown that if you're going to get this done, get a board certified specialist surgeon to do it, not just your local veterinarian. There's better results, obviously, when an expert actually performs it. And that can prolong um, what we call disease-free survival time, which is a measurement used very frequently in oncology, animals and people. So how long does it take before the cancer comes back again? Imaging helps um, because you need to just find out where this thing is. And I had a quick look on your website and saw that recently you had actually uh, funded that. That said, these tongues of tumor cells are often microscopic and imaging doesn't go down to that level. So although it's helpful, it's not the absolute solution to the problem. Um, if the margins are too narrow, then on average the recurrence will happen in about two months as opposed to more than a year. So it's very, very important. That's why people are looking at imaging to get that thing off. I showed you this when we were looking at mast cell tumours. So this is what pathologists would do. Here's our sarcoma. This is the whole piece of skin. That's the edge of the tumour there. They'll often put a suture or something in just to tell us, oh, hey, the suture was on the left side or the top or the bottom so that we can tell them what's going on. We would take a slice right through the middle. So we're going to look at this margin, this margin. So it's here, here, and then the deep one. Take one there. Okay, we're going to look at this margin and this margin. Take one on the other side, going to look at that margin and that margin. 
and that's fine, but each section is only, it's less than five microns thick and a micron is a thousandth of a millimetre. So it's a very thin piece of tissue and so we're not going to look at absolutely every part of the tumour and we have these little tongues of tumour cells coming out. We may or may not have them in the section we look at. So it's never a guarantee that the excision was complete, but as with imaging, we're just doing our best to try and see what's going on. Okay, so with surgery alone, uh, the disease-free survival time is about six months, which, you know, is quite reasonable. Um, but sometimes the tumours are too big or they've gone onto bone, so we can't get them out anyway. Um, now, if it's on a limb or the tail, you could potentially amputate that limb or part of the tail and cure it. So if it's distal to the hock and the hind limb, which is why the ankle, uh, or if it's in the distal third of the antebrachium, which is this area here, so if it was down, dis distal means further down, or if it was on the distal third of the tail, so towards the tip, it's possible that you could chop that off and get rid of the tumour. Um, studies on radiotherapy have been quite variable, but there seems to be agreement out there that in general, if you use radiotherapy and surgery, and the radiotherapy could be before or afterwards, that you get a better result. So here's a, an example of an imaging plan. Here's a sarcoma, massive tumour here, and this is the area that they're going to irradiate. Pretty cool technology now to look at that sort of thing. Um, Median disease-free intervals are pretty good, you know, more than a year to, you know, more than a couple of years. So that seems to be the best option. Okay, so how do we prevent this? Because obviously you don't want to be in that situation having this massive surgery and radiotherapy. So here's our vaccination advisory panel again. The last report they made was five years ago. So they say only give non-core vaccines when necessary. So for example, with feline leukemia virus, if your cat doesn't go outside and there's no other cats in the house that go outside, or you might not be in an area that has it, then don't do it. Don't do anything you don't have to do. They list rabies as non-core, but that depends on legislation. So here in Colorado, we have to vaccinate cats for rabies. They say give the core vaccines no more often than every three years. So we used to just give these every year. And now we know that their immunity actually lasts quite a long time. Uh, and they're saying give the injection into the subcutis, not to the muscle. So if there is a cancer, we see it and can feel it. It's easier to detect. Right, remember I said we were getting fewer tumours into scapula, but more tumours on the limbs. And keep in mind this advisory panel. So what they're saying is inject into the tail or inject uh, below the right elbow for those core vaccines, below the right knee for rabies, below the left knee for feline leukemia. So what we've done by giving these recommendations is just shift where it's happening um, to sites that would be easier to amputate. When I thought about this, I realised my own cat had always been injected into scapula. So you probably have to stand there and query whether the vaccine's been warmed up and where this thing's going to be given. And the owner should monitor the injection site afterwards. Okay, do we all agree about this? So this is a very interesting uh, thing that I found in the literature. So this paper came out in 2015 with all sorts of recommendations. You know, what are the recommendations about feline injection site sarcoma? And they said, oh, you should use the vaccines that don't have adjuvant in them. And then this researcher, and we don't usually see this sort of debate in the literature, and I actually like it because I think we should debate these things, says that actually the evidence for that is pretty weak. Um, I have some sympathy to the people making the first statement. I'm going to send Cowley these two papers because this author actually, in the process of discussing this, talks about some of the problems we have in veterinary research about what animals we use, how many, and this tendency to have one little study, turn it into gospel, and keep following it. And we had a number of grants come to the Large Animal Board this year 
looking at clinical things that people have been doing for years with no evidence, and now we're doing the science to see if that's okay. So I'll send them to you. I think it's a really great review of what to look at that's good or bad in veterinary studies. Um, so I'll send those to you, Kelly. Uh, they're open source. Okay, so I'm just going to let the cats <laughs> round up some of them, then I'm, and then I've got a couple more slides. Okay, so sarcomas are cancers arising from mesenchymal cells, so now we know what those are. We don't really understand why cats are so susceptible. We know we need to get the whole tumour out because it's really that recurrence that is a problem, although they will metastasise later on. Uh, <laughs> I have a 20-year-old cat with no teeth who likes gravy, so <laughs> I have sympathy. Just to, you know, we're getting a bit serious here because uh, it gets bad now. So vaccination should only be as necessary, preferably at sites we can amputate, which is, you know, really not a great scenario, right? <laughs> I mean, this is really a terrible place we're at with the science. So I'm going to give you two more slides. Okay. Is it high impact? This is something we think about on the boards. Um, well, it's one in 10,000 cats vaccinated, so you might look at that and go, oh, it's not that many animals. Um, but when you start looking at what's coming through the clinic, just as I was talking about with mast cell tumours, then it becomes a bigger issue. And when you're looking at what's coming through the diagnostic lab, this is a pretty common problem in our patients. So I would say, yes, it's high impact. And the really terrible thing about this is it's associated with something good which is preventing disease in feline populations. And so if you go online, there's people talking about it. Should I vaccinate my cat? My cat might get cancer. If someone said to you, I'm gonna vaccinate you, but your chance of getting a tumor is 50% higher now, would you feel good about that? So this is a pretty serious problem for cats. And I know you don't get many you haven't had enough feline grant applications recently, but we have this huge issue here. So what are the issues? So we've had some really interesting epidemiology on this, but it doesn't seem to have really solved the problem to any great degree. It probably has reduced it, but really we're still amputating legs and doing huge surgeries. And a lot of the research seems to be focused on that because we don't understand it. Uh, we don't know why injections cause carcinogenesis, which means formation of cancer cells. We don't understand that. And until we do, we're not really gonna solve the problem. So we're not approaching this very scientifically. We're approaching it by looking at how we can reduce it or prevent it, but we don't know why it happens. Now in the medical world, there's an absolute revolution going on in immunotherapy, if you guys read about this in the news, okay, we've got lots and lots of drugs being developed. So if we look here, this is looking at drug development 2012 to 2016. This is chemotherapy. This is immunotherapy. It's, ex it's exploding. And, you know, immunotherapy may or may not be useful for cats, but the point I'm making is there's a lot of people working on the immune response and how that relates to cancer. So we use lots of things called biomarkers. We're looking at sections of cancer tissue, and we're looking at what immune cells are here. I saw nothing at all in the literature about this on feline sarcoma. So it's not translating over to cats. So we have a revolution going on, and the cats are not a part of it. And then I thought, well, what are, what are people doing? Because the other thing, I, and I'm only on the large animal board, but a lot of the grants that come in come from veterinary schools. We don't really see a lot coming from other people. So what are people outside this insular little veterinary world doing about sarcoma? So this is in the human field, and this paper says, inflammatory stress and sarcomagenesis are vicious interplay, which is exactly what we have going on in feline injection sites. And here's another paper, sarcoma immunotherapy past approaches and future directions. So there are some very eminent people putting a lot of effort into this sort of thing, and it's not been used on the cat tumors at all. So this is what I would do. Form an advisory board, get some of these people. 
get some immunologists, put some dogs amongst the cats here, okay, Di diversity, get someone from the vaccine advisory board, put them together, agree on what we need to do to understand why when we inject cats, they're prone to sarcomas, prioritize it, raise some funding. Vaccine companies have some skin in the game here. Maybe they would be interested with the caveat they'd have to put up with whatever you found. But obviously they get a lot of questions from people as to why we should use your vaccines. Get hold of some of these people. Veterinary researchers are really bad at finding these people. But I had a lot of success with government level funding because these people love naturally occurring animal disease models and they get really enthusiastic but they're not in the veterinary world so they don't know about it and they probably would become involved and be very valuable if they knew so I would actually get hold of some of these people and try and encourage some of these veterinary medical immunology people to get together this is my name for the campaign Disfis. <laughs> I'm not a marketing person, so I'll probably get thrown <laughs> out. <laughs> uh, and either an open call, but I've also seen funding agencies commission things. So it might be you start talking to these people, they have a fantastic idea, and you could say, hey, send it in to us, we'll review it, and let's see if we can fund these things. So it's this sort of driving the science uh, that starts to solve some of these problems. So I was actually quite horrified because I don't really work in this field when I went and looked at the literature, how primitive the science was. Um, there wasn't a lot going on. No one was looking at the immunology really properly. People are just trying therapies without any reason why. People are trying immunotherapy, but the cancer has been caused by the immune system in the first place. So we're getting into dangerous territory there. And that gets me to the final kitten. Thank you. <laughs> that was awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Very well done. Happy to take any questions. Yeah, uh, I'm curious why the lungs are common metastasis spot. Is it surface area? Is it unknown? Right, so if you get cancer cells going into blood vessels, everything anatomically goes back, all the blood goes back through the lung to be oxygenated. And in the lung are all of these beds of really tiny vessels where we're having this oxygen exchange. So they end up in the lung and they get physically stuck there or adhere there in the lung. Um, and sarcomas tend to go straight there instead of to lymph nodes. With a lot of cancers, the lung is gonna be ultimately where it goes. There's no breed of cat that specifically gets this? I kind of looked at that and I couldn't see anything. I, I think that would be another area that should be looked at because we see all these genetic studies coming through and I couldn't see anything too definitive there. So I don't think they've found anything. And I don't know, anecdotally, I don't think there's a, any veterinarians here have heard of. It just seems to be cats okay. as a species. And is there... If a cat is getting, has been getting injections, mm -hmm. and then all of, maybe not in the same site, is there just, it all of a sudden happens? Or is it more concentrated when they get it in the same site? You know, I don't think there's any rules, because um, we don't really know what it's related to. Um, I would certainly, with a cat, not want someone to keep injecting in the same place. So that said, the vaccination people are saying, put this one on the right leg, put this one on the left leg. So they're almost encouraging repeat injections anyway. Um, you know, that one time could be enough. It might not have happened here at this point, but it might happen there at that. So I don't think you can say, because it didn't happen before, it's not gonna happen okay. now, if you're a cat yes, owner. It's <laughs> another question. Yeah. Uh, just had a suggestion, um, instead of dispis, you could say fispis. Oh. Mm. <laughs> we can argue over that. <laughs> <laughs> it's not my area of expertise, admittedly. Okay, thanks for coming, guys. Thank you. Thank you.